Welcome to the Travel Leader Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Vandenberg. On our show, I interview and connect with leaders across travel, hospitality, and tourism. We talk leadership in our industry, what has shaped them, the successes, failures, and everything in between. Today, I'm speaking with Saxton Sherrod, founding partner and CEO of Revival Hotels. Before we start, I wanna let you know about the Travel Leader community. Every month, I'll be gathering a group of travel leaders to continue the conversation about leadership. This is a group for travel leaders looking to share, reflect, and grow their leadership competencies with the support of myself as a trained coach. Learn more at www.thetravelleadercoach.com. And with that, I would like to welcome Saxton to the show. Thank you, Rachel. So excited uh, to be here and, and be part of the show and the travel leader community this morning. Yes, welcome. Uh, so you are the founding partner of Revival Hotels, a management company. Uh, and I was introduced to you, to your company by a fellow colleague, Greg, who is part of your team. And I, I just, I was really interested when I looked at your website, your approach was, is very appealing and is a, I think a great way to look at hotel management in terms of from a profit angle, just rather than just from a revenue angle. Um, so I think that's a great vision. And, and I think in this conversation, we're going to hear more about your vision and your type of leadership. Uh, so excited to talk about that. Thank you. No, it's uh, um, I joke. If most people knew that I was running a management company, uh, they would think I was crazy or what happened to you? Because a lot of the reason of starting a management company was saying, I don't really like what's out there. I don't really like the way it's done. There's this misalignment. There's something there's something wrong uh, with, with what's out there today. So when something's wrong, you can either complain about it or you can change it. Uh, and after a uh, Couple late nights. I decided to do the uh, to do the latter. So uh, hence uh, hence the birth of Revival Hotels. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's part of entrepreneurial leadership, right? Is finding opportunities to do things in new ways uh, and finding gaps in the market. Uh, so it sounds like you're onto something there. Would you actually would you say that that is actually a red thread in your career? And if so, you know, what else might be kind of common to that red thread? Yeah, absolutely. And we didn't talk about this before anyone, but absolutely. When I think of red threads in my career, I think my appetite for change is really the biggest red thread that kind of goes through everything. For me, you're, I'm unable to accept that things are the way they are. I don't know whether that was something I developed as a kid or that's something naturally uh, in me that it's. If, if the idea of we've always done it this way um, is just not an acceptable thing for me. And, and in our industry on the whole, where one of the great things about our industry is meritocracy and the ability to grow from a line level position to someday being a general manager or someday being a CEO mm -hmm. of a company. That's a wonderful thing. But in some ways, it creates this idea of groupthink. And in some ways, it creates mm. this idea of I do things the way my boss did them or I did do things the way I was trained to do them. And this might be the only way to do things. The, I would say the red thread through my career has been able to say, why are we doing it that way? Why don't we try it another way? What's the worst thing that can happen? It fails and we go back to the old way tomorrow. But at least we gave it a try and at least we tried something different. So. I've been blessed uh, in my career to work for individuals, with individuals, with organizations that have given me the ability uh, to think differently, to install change, to think out of the box. And I think that certainly has been uh, a red thread of my career. And now, you know, you mentioned Greg, who Greg Williams is our vice president of operations. He does a phenomenal job for us at Revival um, and, and trying to surround myself by people who have that similar mindset, um, mm. because I think that it's contagious when you do. Yeah, absolutely. You got to get the right people on board. Um, you know, I think I, I love how you point out that it starts with that question. Why yep. are we doing it this way? Yep. Because I think we often take that for granted, right? Like we just get so used to doing the same things every day, day in and day out, for sure. I always tell my teams when we take over a new uh, account or a new hotel, you know, I meet with the teams and the first question is asking why. Right. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is it done this way? Now, I have three under five, uh, three kids under five at home. So I'm used to the why, why, why. And I, I don't want my teams. I don't want my teams to do that. Uh, so I tell them, ask why. 
that's sort of the B answer. But if you want to get the A, come up with the why not. Why not try doing it this way? Mm. Why not thinking of it this way? And if you can get the why and why not, I really think most people are onto something. And that creates a culture of always wanting to be better. Wow, that's super powerful. Uh, you know, I was actually thinking, could you tell a story about when you have actually done this in practice and been successful at introducing new change in the past? I mean, change doesn't have to be big. And I would also say that too often, I think change comes from an organization that are hundreds of miles away from their hotels and an office somewhere and pushed down and may or may not actually understand things. For us, change is always about how do I embrace the team that knows their job, their specific job at that specific hotel better than anyone mm -hmm. can? And how do we do that? So, you know, we have a hotel in Groton, Massachusetts, uh, the Groton Inn. It's a gorgeous old uh, New England style inn and have a great program to be green conscious. We don't have water bottles in rooms. We have water stations on every floor with these beautiful glass bottles and ice buckets. And, you know, housekeepers, it's a one more thing to put in the room. Right. It's one more thing to put in the room to carry these water glass water bottles, set them in place, make sure they're clean to be clean between guests and so forth. The other thing is the water bottle would go into the room empty and then the guests would be told that there's an ice uh, and water station on every floor to go fill that up as, as they wanted. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking to one of our housekeepers and she's like, oh, you know, I got to put this in the room. I have to put that in the room. I have to put this in the room. You know why? And I'm sitting to myself saying. Why do they put the bottle in the room, right? For me, I come back to my room after a day at work, after dinner. I then have to pick up the bottle, go down to the go down to the hallway, fill it up only to come back. So she said, yeah, you're right. Why, why do you have to do that? Why not have the bottles stored in a nice, aesthetic way near the station so that people can go ahead, pick up their bottle, fill it, bring it to their room with them? Now, that's not a big change, right? I, I think one of the things... When people talk about change management, and that was a focus of my career in consulting for a while, uh, you know, they always want the what's the million dollar change or what's the silver sword. Uh, the hospitality industry has very few of those, uh, if any. Uh, it's about it's about the small changes and creating that culture of change yeah. that all add up together. So, while moving a glass bottle from a guest room uh, to a you know to the landing where the water refresh station is isn't a big thing. It starts to put people in that culture. It starts to say, how can my life be easier? What are the things that I'm doing that don't make sense? Mm -hmm. What are the things that I can do to be better, to offer better service, to offer better work efficiency uh, for my housekeeping team? And it's that culture that you start to see all of these little things start to add up one-on-one -on -one, and, and you really see massive improvement. Oh, I'm so on board with that. I think that's such a great example because it really speaks to habits that we've built and habits are little pieces that seem insignificant on a daily basis. But when you add those up in terms of your processes as a company, that it really is meaningful. It is. Um, and it, it's, it's Rachel, I, I just, I, I love the fact that you say that, right? One of my earlier roles was I, I started a consulting firm called Postscript Hospitality. And at Postscript, we worked with organizations around the country from 15-star Meadowood uh, in Napa to uh, Courtyard Inn in um, Columbus, Ohio, to we consulted for the Four Seasons brand. We had all of these different uh, roles. And, and the biggest thing is we saved large amounts of money. We worked with these hotels to be much more effective, much more efficient, drive profitability, drive operational efficiency. But it was the culture. It was the small things. Mm -hmm. It was no one big change item. It was how do I get people to think mm. in this new process? How do I get people to question and feel empowered to question what goes on on a daily basis? And that's where you start to see true magic. And that's where you start to see improved guest service, improved revenue generation, and, and, and decreased costs, which in a time like today or any time in the hospitality industry is are, are keys, to, keys to success. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it sounds like you're already having a big impact on the industry with these, this kind of thinking. And ultimately, what is that impact that you want to have in yeah, the long term? I, I like that. I, to me, there's twofold. I can talk more about the change and we'll talk a lot about that because I think that really defines who we are. Mm -hmm. But as far as the impact on the industry, 
you know, I've always been in this business. My father was a chef. My mother was a director of catering. That's how they met. That's why I'm here. My sister's in the business. My brother-in-law's a chef. Everyone except my wife, she was spared. Uh, and everyone <laughs> asks me why, why you want to be in hotels? Why do you want to be in hospitality? And even if you're in hotels, hospitality on the whole. And for me, there's this innate feeling, something at my core that I believe life is hard. Right. Like, uh, you know, I can come on and sugar and rainbows, but I don't care if whether you're a billionaire or you're living paycheck to paycheck. Life is difficult. Right. Mm -hmm. We have health problems. We have family problems. We have money problems. We have uh, anything we can't control. We can't control the world. Right. So for me, I believe that the greatest thing we can do for our fellow man is give them a break, give them a chance to escape. Now, that, that escape can be, uh, you know, 10 minutes for a quick drink, can be an hour for a dinner, can be a, a two-hour spa treatment, can be a full day at a hotel, can be a week, can be a month at a hotel, right? But for e whatever period of time somebody has to be able to escape, we I want my impact on the industry to be to create the environments that they're allowed to step into, forget about all of those other things. And truly be immersed in escapism hospitality. So my hope is that we're able to do that for people. And, you know, I'm also a believer in giving credit to others uh, where it's due. So to me, Blackberry Farm uh, in, in Tennessee is probably one of the greatest resorts right now in our country. And a lot of that came from the, the, the brain of Sam Bell and uh, trying to create something special. And Sam uh, used to have this saying of make a great day. Uh, not have a great day, which we usually say, but, but make a great day. And, and that's really, really powerful on two senses. First off, we can only control the days for ourselves. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what problems come up. We can control whether it was a great day or not a great day. But especially for people who work in the travel industry, we are blessed, right? We have this other responsibility that other people don't have, that we can go ahead and make great days for other people. Uh, so I try to tell my teams that I try to remember that every day, any email you'll ever get from me gets signed, make a great day. And that's just, awesome. that's just a simple, small reminder of, we have the chance to do that. We have a chance to be the escapism. We have the chance to be the best part of what could be a problematic day for somebody else. And, and that's not a, uh, something to take lightly. So you're essentially saying that it's really like we have the individual agency to change things and make things better. Absolutely. I mean, how yeah. special how special is that? Not everybody can do that, right? I mean, everyone can do that for themselves, but not everyone has that ability to do that for others as well. That's a special gift hospitality people have. Yeah, no, that's that's super empowering. And I think it also just relates to the deeper purpose, right, which helps motivate people and yeah. um, gives them like a deeper why for what we're doing as an industry. Absolutely. And when you forget that, we become a commodity, right? There are so many hotels. Right. There are so many hotels under similar brand flags these days. We have more and more uh, commoditization of properties, we'll right. say. Um, so what really could make us special or make anybody special is, is doing that. And that's not a power that's just reserved for a general manager or a CEO of a company. That's a power that every single person who works at a hotel, whether you be the front desk agent or you're uh, the housekeeper or, or whatever role you're in, you have that ability uh, to do that. And that's, sure. that's super special. For sure. So shifting gears a little bit to your qualities as a leader, how would you think others around you would describe you? It's funny. This was one of the hardest. Uh, Rachel did ask me this question beforehand, and yeah. uh, it was hard because, you know, I was sitting down writing things and I wanted to hear what I wanted to say. Right. Like I wanted to to say what I wanted people to think about me. Uh, right? So I said, forget this. Uh, I'm going to call my partner, uh, our COO, Kathy Marcotte, who is um, one of the smartest people I've ever had the chance to work with. Uh, we've known each other for a long time, even before Revival. And I said, Kat, tell me, <laughs> good, bad, take the gloves off. Uh, how would you describe me as a leader? Luckily, she said something okay and good. So, yeah. And it was actually very congruent with what I wanted to say. So I was really happy about that. And, and the two words she used were creative and inspirational. Uh, and I think that the two words really need to go together, right? I think 
you've heard me talk now for a few minutes. I think people could probably guess the creativity, the desire to change, the desire to want to create new products, new ways of doing things. I think that's out for there. Sure. But yeah. to me, the thing with creativity is, unless you're also inspirational, those just stay at ideas, right? They don't mm. actually become action items, right? Everybody, anyone can have a great idea, but it's turning that idea into reality. That yeah. is, that is the, that is the important piece. And for me as a leader, I know that I can't do that by myself, right? right. I can't do everything. I can't be the one at all of our hotels checking everybody. And I can't be the one cooking every entree, nor would I be good at it, right? Like, mm -hmm. listen, I don't think you want me making your bed in the morning. I'm not very good at making beds. Uh, but instead it's how do we have these creative ideas? And then more importantly, how can I inspire those around me to want to be part of those ideas? And to, to take action, right? So, <laughs> to take action and get them done, get them exactly. to execute it. Otherwise, yeah, I mean, that's such a critical point you make, that connection between creativity and, and inspiring. Yeah, otherwise yeah. it just sits still. <laughs> no, it's it, it, you need to, or else it lives up here, right? And if it lives up here, it's no better for anyone else other than, other than me. So um, I for like sure. to make sure that... I'm inspirational to the team as much as possible in a way that they want to be in the same boat as I am. Can we, can we make that a little bit more concrete and share with our listeners? How do you actually do that? You know, maybe with an example and, and how you've inspired. <laughs> well, sometimes I'm too creative. Uh, I had this one great partner I used to work with at one point, um, Mike Hoover, and he used to hold me to one great, uh, one big idea of the week. That was what he used to say. He said, I can't take all your big ideas. You have one big idea of the week. So, Oh, yeah. Sometimes uh, people like you could be a nightmare. That's right. That's right. He's like, I, too much work to do. Mike is an unbelievable executor, probably one of the best hotel operators I know. Um, so he said, you have one, one idea of the week. So, uh, you know, we would have this one idea, and then it would be, well, how do we install it? Right. Uh, and not only how do we install it from the process perspective, how do we get people excited about it? Right. Getting people excited is a huge piece of my leadership style. And we can kind of talk about that. Of When I was uh, a young manager, I was living and working in Las Vegas. Uh, I was the hotel manager at Caesars. And here I was a young guy managing 1500 rooms at that point. Wow. And what do I do all day? And someone, a really great mentor of mine, gave me a book called The Three Signs of a Miserable Job. It's by Patrick Lincoln. It's a great title of a book. It's very catchy. And it's a fun read. It's not a, it's not a, you know, I read all the management books. Some are a little bit more dense than others. This one was really fun. Um, and what it talked about is that there are three parts of management uh, or, in, or inspiring people, or there are three things that make them not inspired or, managed, or, or felt like they're taken care of. And those things are irrelevance, and measurement, and anonymity, right? So if irrelevance, if they don't feel like they're part of the greater good, if they're not making a product that has a difference, or they don't see how their benefit leads to another work group that has benefit, Right. They, 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 they become uninspired. This job misery, yeah. as uh, as Patrick puts it. Right. Second one was a measurement. I believe I'm a competitive guy. Uh, I believe everybody wants to win. Even if you don't want to win, you don't want to lose. Right. At right. the end of the day. And to, to win, you need to know how to keep score. And I think it's part of our business. One of the hardest things is we do a lot of repetitive work. We check guests in. We cook covers. We uh, make rooms, uh, clean rooms. So what do we do? What is the measurement to know that I had a good day or I had a bad day? To know that I won today or I didn't win today and I have to modify my behavior to, to do better tomorrow. So adding that measurement piece is huge. And to me, of the three of these, while you need to improve all of them, anonymity is ultimately the biggest one. Too often, we know people just as colleagues. Right. Uh, yeah. We know people just as, hey, so and so is a cook, so and so is a housekeeper, so and so is a front desk agent, so and so is the general manager. But the fact is, that's just a small piece of, of every single person. And sometimes maybe the most insignificant piece right. of, of that person. You know, we take a lot of time of really trying to understand people and who they are out of there. I don't care how much you like your job. And you could love your job. I love my job. But I'll tell you what, if I won the mega bucks, whatever it is these days for $2 billion <laughs> or whatever crazy number it is, 
You know, right. I might not be, uh, I might not be uh, coming to work. Sorry, I'm just plugging my computer in. Uh, I might not be coming to work uh, bright and early tomorrow morning, right? And it's the same thing with everyone. So it's how do you connect with people on more than just the job? Uh, Absolutely. What is, are, you a, are you a huge Yankees fan? What's going on with the team this week? Uh, your, is your child in the school play? Uh, what, what's the school play? What role is she, he or she in? Um, you know, are you so, you're going on a vacation celebrating your anniversary? Where are you going? It's getting to know people on that level to know that they are more than just employee number one, two, three, four. Right. And, yeah. and to me, that is a huge way of inspiring people. And when people start to feel inspired, start to feel part of it, now they're way more likely to, A, feel comfortable talking to you, bringing to you their great ideas. Mm -hmm. And then, B, when you're installing an idea together, you kind of have a jumping off part. You have commonality on which you can build from to start to say, let's do it this way. I know you know how to do this because of this, right? Like you start to have this more open conversation that's much more effective than just directing. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. I had never heard of that book. And I that's, it's such a great formula and way to look. I think it, it makes it also really practical in giving people ideas on yes. how to put that into practice. Can you actually, can you repeat the name of the book? Yeah. So it's called The Three Signs of a Miserable Job by Patrick Lincoln. And there might be, Great. you might find it under a different name because at one point it changed. Then the title's okay. kind of weird. I think it yeah. might be the fable of workplace and uh, workplace satisfaction. But if you search the three signs of a miserable job, you'll find it. And yeah. kind of the book itself is, is really enjoyable to read. Um, the whole concept is the main character was a very successful CEO, uh -huh. uh, retired, sold his business, and he wanted to prove that his leadership style could be applied to different environments. So wow. he purchased yeah. and ran a pizza shop and he wanted uh -huh. to understand whether these same sort of principles would allow him to be successful in, in running a pizza shop. Uh, wow. So it's a, it's a, it's a fun book to read. Um, again, well, I was I'm blessed putting that, that one, one my, on my list. For yeah, sure. please do. I was blessed that one of my mentors gave it to me really when I was super young and it had this, I feel, I feel like there's probably, you know, five to 10 books in someone's life that they read and it's yeah. kind of like a, a changing piece for them. This was mm -hmm. one of my first, so. Absolutely. I, I'm a huge fan of resources like that. And I, I often speak about books and resources on the show uh, to yeah, help inspire our leaders uh, to keep to keep finding that kind of information to help them in their their leadership. So that's great. I will say that's a thing, commonality yeah. between anyone. I wish I read more and it's an effort. It was one of my 23 uh, New Year's resolutions and continues to be there. But when I look to leaders I've worked for who have been inspiring great leaders, guys who have run great companies um, or women who have run great companies, one of the things that um, they all have in common when I take it back and take a step back and try to boil it down, what were their reasons for success? All of them were always reading. Uh, uh, so something I try absolutely. to do. Absolutely. Yes. I'm a big proponent. That's, I'm so glad you emphasized that. The other thing I wanted to point out, which is really useful, is how you kind of um, how you got feedback on yourself as a leader. And that's a really important exercise to do on a regular basis is to actually ask people, I'd like some feedback. You know, I want to see, am I am I putting out what I think I'm putting out and are you receiving it that way? And being able to make those adaptations to what you're doing to to really do and be the kind of leader that you're intending to be so that's something everybody can do you just have to ask yep. and, and i would say obviously i'm blessed that i have people and a great team that i can go to and ask questions and ask that and get that feedback and something i do regularly maybe maybe sometimes too much they'll tell you uh but also everybody uh whether you have those people or you feel comfortable talking to those people Everybody has access to a mirror, right? Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. and to me, I take time uh, weekly to look in the mirror, not because I'm vain, not because I want to see what I look like, but to actually look at the person because I can't lie to the person in the mirror, right? I can't mm -hmm. lie. I say, did you do a good job this week, right? Uh, mm -hmm. what, what do you need to do that you don't want to do? Uh, I ask myself those questions and 
you can't lie to yourself. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, right. it's great getting that feedback from other people. But if you're ever worrisome that, um, you know, people are telling you what you want to hear, it's also important to safeguard that uh, with the mm -hmm. idea of asking yourself how you're doing. Uh, yeah, great in, in tip. Great tip. Speaking of wonderful books and inspiration and resources, one of my favorite books is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Yep. Absolutely. And so, you know, along those lines in terms of what he talks about in that book and his experience in the concentration camps, which is, you know, a really dramatic um, and tragic uh, um, story, obviously, about finding meaning. What gives you meaning in your life and work? Oh, that's a tough question. What gives me meaning? Um, you know, uh, well, it was great. First off, that was a great book. You know, a friend of mine, life coach, uh, Sam Levine, who's a very good friend, runs a company called Selfful Man. Um, he recommended that really early on to me, uh, and it was, yeah. it was a game changer, right? It was how could someone put in that situation, be able to put things into perspective mm -hmm. in the way he was able to do, Victor was able to do. It was fascinating. For me, I find meaning in making a difference, right? Mm -hmm. um, I could not, while well, it's the right fit for some people, everyone has different uh, sources of meaning. I'm not the type of person who could go work at the plant every day and produce the same item over and over again and get the gold mm -hmm. watch after 20 years, right? That's right. That's not who I am. I find my meaning in making a difference, right? And making a difference in, in different ways. I like to see that my work creates something. I like to see that my work, you know, I'm, I'm, I wish I was more artistic because I'm very jealous of interior designers and architects yeah. and so forth. Who, who, I'm who with you there. <laughs> the, this, you know, their work is on display all the time. But I, I like to see that my work means something, that, they, that what I did was responsible for creating something new, right? Whether mm -hmm. that's a new product, a new offering, a new service style, a new something, right? Mm -hmm. And then I like to see that I made a difference in people's lives, right? Uh, I hate the worst part of my job is sitting in my office miles away from a hotel um, and, and thinking what's happening there. I want to get to the hotel, even if I'm not managing, even if I'm not doing anything, I want to see that I made a difference in those guests' lives, right? I want to see that yeah. um, you, you never know who the people are who are there, right? I think that's one of the things, again, that's magical about, magical about our industry, is someone could be checking into a hotel and it could be night 250 that they're in a hotel that year and they're a business travel and it's just another night. Or you could find someone who's been saving for 15 years to celebrate their 20th anniversary at this hotel and you can make that special. Or, you know, when I was a graduate in a lot of college markets, how many parents, it was the first person in their family to go to college and they were able to celebrate that, whether dropping their student off or being there at graduation, right? It's being there in the good times. Also, what we forget in the hotel business is people travel during some of the worst times in their lives. People yeah. travel for mm. funerals. People travel for, uh, you know, uh, med medical needs. People travel, uh, people are out of their house uh, in a hotel after a devastating fire right. or flood or, or something like that. We can also be there and make people's days better, make a difference Yeah. in the, in those hard times. And, um, David Rochefort was the president of Graduate Hotels, very good friend of mine, um, great person that I love talking to about uh, about these things, right? We would sit, when we were at graduate, we would sit for hours talking about making great days and experience creation. Yeah. And David started his career, he'll tell everyone, at the Ronald McDonald House. Uh, yeah. And they're like, does it make, you know, like you're a hotel guy, you worked for all these hotel companies. And he said what that taught him was the idea of being there in the good time, the bad times, as well yeah. as the good times. And it's a, yeah. a super powerful message. Uh, and it, it, it's true, true to our business. So for me to make a difference is I want to make a difference for the best of times for people, for the worst of times of people. And then I also want to make a difference in the physical product in our business. And that's yeah. what gives me meaning. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that's coming through for me uh, as we're having this conversation is the extent to which you're humanizing hospitality, you know, and, you know, really be not only with the guests, but with the people you work with, 
um, your employees, your team members, that really humanizing everything about it. Um, and looking at it from a much bigger life perspective. I don't want to sell rooms. I mean, that's a, you, I, you, you know, that's probably, I hope that doesn't go in a quote somewhere and people are like, oh my God, this guy doesn't want to sell rooms. What's he doing? Uh, no, but I, I don't. I, I want to sell experiences, right? Uh, I, I think that, we're yep. in the experience business. I don't think we're in the, in the room business. And certainly there is a segment of our industry that is in the room business. Yes. And I give them all the credit in the world. Um, mm -hmm. I, and I give them uh, a pat on the back. I just could I just couldn't do that, nor do I want to do that. Sure. Yeah. And I I mean I think there's a place for that, right? I mean Absolutely. there there are different business models that speak to different strengths and um but you know I think or and when there there's an opportunity to really go really deep into the the full scope of what hospitality means on a daily basis and yeah. uh those are great examples for sure no, I, I agree i mean yeah. hospitality is is connecting right uh yes. it's inviting someone into your home it's doing all of those things that is the base of hospitality and yeah um we need yeah. to do more of it today because you know, I find as, as, as costs are increasing and we're in the environment that we're in financially, it's easy, it's easy to forget those things that make a difference. Yeah, for sure. So turning to a little bit of your personal learning and development, when have you underestimated yourself? When have I underestimated myself? Um, so I started my career in operations. Um, I was, you know, I went to, I went to Cornell. I was a complete operations guy. I don't want to touch anything else. And I went and worked in Vegas. It's a wonderful experience. And, and a few years afterwards, I said, Hey, I want a new challenge. Um, and I saw this job posting, uh, for a consultant job, a hotel consulting job, a consulting firm was getting into the hospitality sector, mm -hmm. needed a hospitality expert in consulting. So I applied for this job and I, I'll always remember this. My dad, and the reason I remember it is my father is extremely supportive. Uh, so this is, this was unlike his nature to not be supportive on this. And, and I remember him wow. saying, you're so young, um, who's going to pay you to consult? And, uh, <laughs> he said that. And all of a sudden I started doubting myself. I said, maybe he's right. Right. Maybe, maybe, maybe my dad's right. Why, why would someone pay me to consult? I haven't done everything. I haven't had 25 years of experience. I hadn't mastered every job. Why, you know, I started underestimating myself. Could I be a consultant? Mm. Could I, could I do this? Um, luckily I did not follow my dad's advice there. Most times those are the mistakes when I don't follow his advice, but that time it was lucky I didn't. And I got into consulting and, and what yeah. I learned from that experience of while I underestimated, underestimated myself of whether I could do it. The reason I underestimated myself is I thought I needed to know everything, have every answer to be able to either lead or advise. And what mm -hmm. consulting taught me that it was not only valuable in consulting, but I think a lot of people who are trying to step up to that management role uh, in their careers, but underestimate themselves of whether or not they can do it, is to be a great consultant, to be a great manager. You don't need to know how to do every job. You don't no. need to have done every job. What you need yeah. to do is you need to know how to lead, how to advise, how to get the most out of people. And consulting right. taught me how to do that. So it was from a, from an environment where I was underestimating myself, could I do it, to all of a sudden having this experience that taught me, not only can I do it, but I don't need all of those other things I thought that were holding me back. And I think yeah. uh, it's a lesson for a lot of managers who are yeah. making that first step into whether they can be a manager or not. Well, and being able, it's, it's about being able to find the answers and the information yep. that you may not have internally or have personal experience with. Yep. And as you as you pointed out earlier in our conversation, it's about surrounding yourself with people who can complement your strengths. Absolutely. And, and that's I'm I'm sure that's that's a huge element of consulting as well. It is. The it's other consulting, thing, managing it, how do you find the right team? Right. It's it's comfortable a lot of times to find people that are like you, and surrounding yes. yourselves with people that are like you, or surrounding yourselves with people that you know you're always gonna get along with because you see things the same way. When yeah. you do that, sometimes you really miss out on the right person that should be there next to you who has that alternative skill set, who has that ability to contribute in a way that you cannot contribute. Nobody, yes. I don't care whether you are 
the greatest CEO of all times or the greatest mind of all time. Nobody can do it themselves. Life is life no. is too much. You cannot be good at everything. So to me, it's how do you focus on uh, what you're good at and how do you find people to focus on what they're good at and put everyone in a position to succeed. We have this um, line I use a lot called the summer of 94. Uh, and I, I tell people, don't summer of 94. And what that means is the summer of 94 was the summer that Michael Jordan decided to stop playing basketball and to play baseball. So stop doing something Ugh, that he was arguably that. the best in the world at and instead did something that he was, listen, way better than the average man at, but not good enough as he was at basketball, right? Right. So he took himself out of a position where he could be successful, the most successful, arguably the greatest player of all time, into a situation where he was not successful, right? That's, that's a choice people make. So I tell people, make sure you put yourselves in the environment where you succeed. And yeah. the environment where you aren't the best, find the resources, find the help, find the person that can bring you, be part of the team, or who can you reach out to to help get you there. Don't be right. a summer of 94. Right. Yeah, that's a great metaphor for sure. The other thing I want to touch on is how you overcame that underestimation. And what I'm hearing from your experience is that you really had to trust yourself and go into that instinctual feeling like, hey, you know, this is the right move for me to try this consulting thing. People are afraid of being uncomfortable, right? People uh -huh. think uncomfortable is a bad word, right? Uh, right? Oh, I don't want to do that. I'm uncomfortable. Or this person is this makes me feel uncomfortable. Uncomfortable being uncomfortable is part of change, right? You cannot have change without being uncomfortable. The easiest way to yes. never feel uncomfortable is to do the same thing every day. So mm -hmm. for me to overcome that, for me to overcome that questioning of myself, I had to take a risk, right? I had to say, I'm going to be uncomfortable today and, and be okay with being uncomfortable, acknowledge when I was feeling uncomfortable, and at those times start to say, okay, what are the changes? What are the new changes that I can make at that point? to start to address those problems and feel more comfortable, whether that's going to a mentor, right. asking advice, whether that's uh, reading the right book, whether that's asking the team around you or listening uh, instead, instead of talking and saying, you know, what can, well, how can it be better for you? That's how we were able to overcome that level of, of being uncomfortable. But the first thing was I had to acknowledge I'm going to be uncomfortable. Uh, yes. And if, mm -hmm. if you are always running, from that feeling, it's hard to progress. Yeah, it's hard to grow. I mean, that that idea of getting out of your comfort zone, as they say, is critical to improving, yeah, improving yourself overall Absolutely. and as a leader, for sure. So we're gonna move on a little bit to, to okay. some of our other questions. What what leadership competencies do you think are needed in the next period of rapid change? Um, guys, I'm not I'm not gonna say it's all sunshines and rainbows uh, for our industry for any industry. I think we're coming on tough times, right? This is not the same business that I was managing 10, 15 years ago. Um, so when I think of what is the next competency that's needed. It's the desire, the openness, and the skill set for change, right? Like I know that's kind of answering yeah. the question with with the with the uh, with the question and the answer, which sometimes isn't allowed, right. but I'm going to try to allow yeah. it today. That again, if you are not somebody who wants to change, I think you are going to struggle. I think that's a competency that's really needed. If you are somebody who doesn't come with a skill set of how can I lead change management, yeah. I think. This is a time that you're going to struggle. You know, the old adage, if it's broke, if it's not broke, don't fix it. It is true. I mean, our industry was not broke for a really long time. We saw decades of growth in, in our yeah. space. Guys, I hate to tell you, it's broken, <laughs> right? Like yeah. Uh, yeah. today's day, and it's not just the hospitality industry. A lot of industries out there, it's broken. Yeah. To, to, yeah. to get better, to be the leader, to overcome uh, the change that is in the environment around us, we need to change as well. You, we are not going to be able to get the same results by doing things the same way we've been doing them uh, historically, the same way we've been doing them for years. So that's the competency that I think is really yeah, most needed. Uh, yeah, I mean, 
you're you're saying essentially that it's not only like it's not only knowing how to lead change management, but it's also you you better learn to love it. You have to. <laughs> you yeah. have to, right? Uh, because you if you don't love it, if you're not embracing yourself, if you're not embracing it, if you're not immersing yourself into it, right? It it, it starts to create that level of, of where, and nobody wants to feel that every day to truthfully change, to make a real difference. You need to love it. And it's a, it's something that I think some people naturally love. Like I, I naturally love change, right? And maybe sometimes too much. Maybe my wife will tell you, I love change too much. Sometimes I don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah. but, but I love it. But if you don't love it, it doesn't mean you can't do it. You just have to start to develop tools or you have to start to develop your own sort of ways of, of managing change that makes sense for you. And again, I think for those who don't change in this next sort of upcoming uh, segment yeah. of our industry or up segment of our life, I think we'll be left behind. So um, yeah. I think it's a necessary competency for all. Yeah, for sure. And that that relates to our next question about what it, what's your leadership edge and change is emerging as a really important theme in this conversation. So yeah. kind of going a little deeper on that, what do you think allows you as a person to embrace that as a really strong competency for yourself? I think it's that I'm, it's a couple things. Uh, first off, I'd say that I want to listen. I want to learn. I want to grow, right? Like we were talking about uh, the books we're reading or some of these things that, that have yeah. influenced us in life. For you to want to change, you need to first say, I want to grow, right? I want to be a student. I want to listen. If you don't acknowledge that or you refuse to acknowledge that, change is hard because change is always going to be driven from you and your perspective, and you will not always be successful. So I want to learn. Right. I want yeah. to learn from everybody. I want to learn from you, Rachel. I want to learn from uh, my colleagues. I want to learn from my my five year old son teaches me things every day. Right. I want to learn from uh, my housekeepers. I want to learn from my cooks. I want to learn how to make things better. I want to learn what is working, what isn't working. Right. So I yeah. think the first piece of that leadership style that drives change is you got to want to learn and you got to want to listen yeah. and you got to want to take the advice that you're told and put that into action. The other yeah. piece of it is you gotta be okay making a fool out of yourself, right? Like, uh, you know, nobody, nobody likes, uh, the pie in the face, yeah. but you gotta be okay with it. Right. Because yeah. sometimes it's going to happen. If you expect every day, everything to happen perfectly in a change environment. Yeah. And when something goes wrong, you become all tightened up and say, oh my God, I can't keep going. You will not be able to get through it. So from a leadership right. perspective, I have to let my team know, not everything I say is going to be right. And I have to let my team know, you might make a decision. It's not, might not always be the right decision, but I support you in making decisions. Yeah. Right. No, no decision yeah. doesn't get you to where you need to be. Yeah. And I mean, I, you, you've just described the two most important elements of having a growth mindset, which is that willingness and um, capability to learn. And secondly, to understand that failure is part of that and to not that it doesn't define you. It's just, it's just a, something that happens on your journey for growth. And it's funny, Rachel, I hate failure, right? Like, I'm not saying I like it, right? I don't want anyone hearing this to be like, oh, well, he's okay failing, right? Like, I right. hate failure, but yeah. I have to be okay with it, right? If, yeah. if not, there will be no growth and there will be no success. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So when all is said and done, how do you want to be remembered? <laughs> Uh, guys, I will say it's another question, Rachel's, and I think this one has kept me up a couple days because I'm I'm trying to think about it. Uh, it's a tough question, right? We get um, we get a little philosophical here on the this one's leaders. super super philosophical and super deep. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell everyone on the call be, before hospitality. While it is my passion, I think everyone can can hear that. Um, I have three kids under five. I have an amazing wife. I have an amazing family uh, who have always been there to support and love me. So. If I'm going to be remembered, I'd say the first thing, the most important thing I want to be remembered as is a, is a great dad and a great family man, great son, great husband. Uh, so uh, beyond the hospitality, and I know that might be the answer that not the answer you're looking for, so I'll keep going. But before before anything, that's what I want to be remembered as first, because 
that is the most important thing to me. Um, when For it comes sure. to the hotel business or my work, again, I want to be remembered as somebody who did things differently, thought out of the box, didn't follow, didn't follow the path. And I don't think that should be a surprise to anybody after, after the conversation right. uh, we just had. But to me, if everyone is looking at an opportunity on one side of the street, you're not going to find me there. I'm going to be on the other side of the street looking where the opportunity is there, right? Because I think that that's the way to win. Uh, yeah. That's the way to be different. You know, on our on the back of our business cards at Revival, we have this Mark Twain quote, which is, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. Yeah. And it's a, it's a yeah. super meaningful thing. And, and especially in the context of remembered, right? Nobody was remembered for just following the pack. Right? right. Nobody was nobody who made a difference in this world. You could say did it because they, you know, they did the way things did it the way people did it before. They sat on the seat in the bus that they were told to sit in. They uh, didn't go where they weren't supposed to go, that they stopped at the uh, the finish line where the person stopped before them. Everybody who is remembered is remembered because they didn't follow the pack. They didn't yeah. do things the way everyone else did. So. Uh, I hope that uh, in the hospitality space and, and not even just hotels, hospitality on the whole, you know, I believe in the larger hospitality piece. I hope people will look back and say, well, he was able to do things differently and that has made an impact on our business. Yeah. And I, that, that is such an important link you made. So many great quotes that we've been talking about today. When I listen back, I'm going to be writing down these sound bites to oh. make sure I get, get, those, get those out there and very clear so, to people listening and reading my content, because um, there's so many good lessons for sure. And there is, by the way, nothing wrong with your first answer as it, you. you know, the first part of your answer as regards to your family. And I'll, I'll tell you the, the, the source of this question comes from one of those influential books in my life, which is seven habits of effective people from Stephen, uh, Covey. And, uh, there's a, there's a part in that book, which talks about keeping the end in mind. And essentially it's a little morbid. It's what do you want to have on your tombstone is what he talks to talks about. And it's so important because what's the reason that we work, <laughs> you yep. know, what, what is our ultimate purpose in life and that the higher calling that we have. And so keeping that, those different aspects of your life in mind are so critical uh, to, to what we do and who we are as people. And that, and that is with that question, that's what, what I'm trying to get at. I want to know you as a person, um, inside the leader part to, to really get a full scope of who you are. So I'm glad you shared that. Thank you. And no, as I, well I, as I agree. And that's also another, another book that for me, that's on, I have a book, I have a shelf in my, in my house where I have all the books that I read that I thought were actually super meaningful that I a would want right. to read again, or B would want to give to a friend, uh, or if someone's right. over what, well, these are the books that you should be looking at. And, and right. that's another one that's, that's, that's on there. So I, I, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, for sure. So looking towards your future, what yep. vision would you pursue if you had everything you needed to succeed right now? Yeah. And I think this probably ties into the second part of my answer before is I think when people think of hospitality, uh, hotels, they think of the very traditional model of hospitality and hotels of, oh, I'm going on a vacation. I'm going for a couple nights away. And, you know, tying to my earlier answer of my goal, my motivation is creating a escape for people um, of how they can escape their lives and have this fun, different hospitality experience that allows them forget to forget their problems. Uh, you know, the vision that if I, you know, everything I need to succeed is I really want to start working on examining different ways that I can allow that hospitality to get into people's lives. Because I do think between the financial situation the world is in, uh, people's spending habits, inflation, I don't think people are going to be able to travel or most people are going to be able to travel as much as they, they were historically, mm. right? I think that the number of trips go down, the length of trips go down. So to me, I really want to start to spend some time, and I've started doing it, right? And I say I want to, it's just I want to be able to do it more formally, um, looking into different types of asset classes, hospitality asset classes, whether that be 
the old school country club model, the social club right. model, the children's, uh, you know, the fact that, again, mentioning I have three kids, the fact that breweries and wineries are winning the family activity day today from the hospitality space is crazy. The fact that we haven't yeah. thought of something to, that, that is more engaging from a hospitality side is yeah. wild to me, right? Not that they don't deliver a great product. They do, but how yeah. does no one come up with something else? So to yeah. me, it's really going to be about looking at these other hospitality asset type, types, especially I also believe in today's world, in the post-COVID world, we have less community focus. We, we belong to less. Mm. Uh, that I think there are ways to utilize hospitality uh, in, in new ways to start to give people that break while satisfying some of these needs and white spaces in the market. So that's, that's, if I, that's my yeah. vision for the space, if I had the, the ability and the time to do it now. And I'm starting to work on it, and I hope to have more uh, in the next, you know, nine to eighteen months uh, in, in that in that arena. But that's 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 my goal. Yeah, it seems what you're talking about is is bringing hospitality to the people, hospitality yeah. experiences more, closer to home in their sur surrounding areas, and making it more a a, a regular part of their community experience. Yeah. I think that's 100% right, right? Like, I don't think I'll ever get into the home, right? But if you think right. about you think about COVID, that's what that's what really got accelerated during that time period, right? Yeah. It was, you know, Uber Eats or uh, Grubhub or Seamless or or even Caviar. Some of these, I could have a Michelin star restaurant dinner at home. It was more accessible for me on a daily right. basis. Or Netflix, instead of having to wait to go to the theater, that was available for me at home. Now, I think it's overcorrected way too far that people don't want to get off their couch today, which I think is a problem. Right. But on right. the other side of things, making it more accessible for people to have yeah. as a routine, to have as part of your daily basis is important. You should be able to enjoy hotel style luxury amenities more often than the twice a year you travel with your family to go to Hawaii. Right. Here, you here. should be able to drive down the street. <laughs> and it's funny, you know, I even even, you know, when you look at the, the country on the whole. Right. If you were around in the 80s, early 90s, you needed to live in New York. You needed to live in Chicago. You needed to live in Los Angeles so you could have that first, star, you know, five star restaurant experience, five star hotel experience, art, culture. You needed to live in these cities. Now you start to see a lot of markets have James Beard restaurants in them. A lot of markets have. Um, a great hotel, have a touring Broadway show, have an orchestra. Now, to me, the next step is how does that get closer to the suburbs, right? Yeah. Um, and not necessarily meaning I'm putting Michelin restaurants or five-star hotels in the suburbs, but what? how can I translate those experiences so people are able to experience them more regularly and be yeah. able to have a better quality of life on the whole rather than these massive peaks and valleys, which I think we see today. Yeah. Love it. Well, that's a great teaser for what's to come for you. I, I look forward to watching how that unfolds. For Thank sure. you. Thank you. Is there anything that you else that you would like to share before we close today? No, I, honestly, I think that Rachel, this was a true pleasure to be on. And, and again, like I, I really enjoyed being able to think about some of these things, right? Because they're not able to always take a time away to think about it. Um, you know, talk, talk to the, your audience about these things. And um, you know, I'm very much out there for everyone who's, who's on the audience. I love talking about this. I'm a nerd, uh, for hospitality yeah. as, as my wife says. And anyway, so happy to talk to anybody about these things at any point. It's what I like to do. Um, but no, you know, awesome. at the end of the day, it's, I said this recently to somebody, um, and it, it's the truth at the end of the day, you need to show up, right? It doesn't matter anything else. Um, you know, the old quote, and you talked about all my quotes in this, but the old quote, you can either, the only two things you can control are punctuality and effort and everything is luck. There's some truth to that, right? Yeah. You can prepare yourself, you can work hard, you can go to the right school, but it doesn't matter what decision you need to make in life, you need to show up. And that's yeah. not just work. Show up for your family, show up for your friends, show up for your, show up for your team. Uh, and I think when you do that, it, it makes a, it makes a really big difference. And I've been blessed in my life that I've had people show up for me and now I want to show up for everyone else. So wonderful. So inspiring. So be sure to connect with Saxton on LinkedIn and check them out at revival hotels. Thank you so much Saxton for joining me today. I Thank really you, enjoyed this conversation until next time. I'm Rachel Vandenberg, and this is the travel leader podcast.